Okay, the last uh, lecture that I'll be giving uh, during this course uh, is Mimickers of Bladder and Neoplasia. So it's important when you think of Mimickers of Bladder and Neoplasia to separate out those that are Mimickers of adenocarcinoma versus those that are Mimickers of urethial carcinoma. And I'll explain why it's critical to kind of keep those two uh, separate uh, kind of entities. So first, the, the, the topics that I'll be discussing in terms of mimickers of bladder adenocarcinoma include florous cystitis glandularis intestinal type, endocervicosis or mullerinosis, and nephrogenic adenoma. All, some of these are photographs that I've taken in several safaris in, in Africa. So intestinal type cystitis glandularis. Also, it's termed colonic metaplasia, and that's because the, the, the cells look, uh, the tissue looks almost like normal colon sometimes. And the features why this can mimic adenocarcinoma is one can see very prominent mucin extravasation, and also sometimes intestinal metaplasia can involve the muscularis propria. And this is one of the big distinctions between mimickers of urethial carcinoma versus mimickers of adenocarcinoma. Mimickers of adenocarcinoma that we'll discuss today can involve the muscularis propria. So just because you see glands in the muscularis propria does not mean that it's cancer. In contrast, if you see urethelial process in the muscularis propria, it has to be tumor. So that's a key thing between mimickers of urethelial cancer and adenocarcinoma. What is the distinction of florid intestinal metaplasia versus adenocarcinoma of the bladder? Intestinal metaplasia has no cytologic atypia. You don't see necrosis. You don't see signaling cells. So here's basically florid intestinal metaplasia. This one doesn't look like a tumor. It's not a problem. But you can see how it looks almost identical to colon. This is a case of florid intestinal metaplasia making a tumor-like mass. So all of the mimickers that I'll be discussing today can clinically, at cystoscopy and by imaging, make what to them, to the clinician, looks like a tumor. So sometimes you are also going to get pushback from the clinician where you will sign something out as, for example, florid intestinal metaplasia, and the clinician will say, well, this was a tumor, and you have to say, yes, intestinal metaplasia can make a tumor-like lesion. So here we can see that there's both uh, a transition between cystitis glandularis intestinal type kind of usual type, to then this intestinal type of transition. Uh, and note here the extracellular mucin, but it's acellular mucin. Here we see these very bland looking colonic type glands floating in mucin. But look at the cytology, the nuclei are very bland, located at the bottom of the cell with abundant goblet cells. And here we see a case of intestinal metaplasia in the muscularis propria. You can see thick muscle bundles on the bottom uh, and, and the top. So just because these glands are in the muscularis propria, again, does not mean that they're carcinoma. Extracellular mucin, again, doesn't mean it's cancer. Another uh, image just showing these intestinal metaplasia glands in the muscularis propria. Higher power, just totally bland cytology, full of goblet cells totally benign. Now, occasionally, intestinal metaplasia can get dysplastic. So the way to look at glandular lesions of the bladder is basically entirely analogous to intestinal type uh, glandular lesions. So you can get dysplastic or adenomatous looking epithelium in intestinal metaplasia, whereas intestinal metaplasia without any atypia is totally benign, not an increased risk factor for cancer. If you see intestinal metaplasia with areas of dysplastic epithelium, those patients are at increased risk of having concurrent and potentially subsequent adenocarcinoma. Here we see intestinal metaplasia where now we've reached the level of almost high-grade dysplasia with the nuclei. You've lost the goblet cells, and the nuclei are starting to go at all levels of the, the thickness of the, earth, of the epithelium. Another example of intestinal metaplasia with high-grade dysplasia, you can still see some areas with goblet cells, but then in some areas we've lost the goblet cells, mark cytologic atypia, you know, we've lost the basally oriented nuclei, so this would be high-grade dysplasia in intestinal metaplasia, and you'd want to tell the urologist they, may, they have to take out this whole lesion. So endocervicosis, typically in women in their 30s and 40s, uh, their symptoms are 
typically pelvic pain, frequency, dysuria, hematuria, dyspareunia, dysmenorrhea. Uh, endocervicus, which I'll talk about, is in the bladder, and it's the most common site. But one can see endocervicosis in uh, the GYN tracts, uterine cervix, and vagina. As I mentioned, with intestinal metaplasia, these make, can be, make a mass up to five centimeters. They're always going to be in the posterior bladder wall, uh, you know, adjacent to the gynecological organs. Uh, and just like endometriosis, endocervicosis sometimes can involve the soft tissue outside the bladder as well. I've seen several cases of endocervicosis misdiagnosed as adenocarcinoma because they involve the muscularis propria. But the key things to separate these out from adenocarcinoma is that there's no stromal reaction and there's totally bland cytology. Just because, again, they're in the muscularis propria does not mean it's malignant. Here at higher power, totally bland cytology. Now, when we talk about adenocarcinomas of the bladder, in contrast, the key thing to remember, and I'll show examples, is that adenocarcinomas of the bladder look like adenocarcinomas of the GI tract. They are always going to have some cytologic atypia. So whenever you see glands that look very bland, you should always be thinking of mimickers of bladder adenocarcinoma in contrast to adenocarcinoma. Here's, this was a partial cystectomy that was done because somebody had misdiagnosed adenocarcinoma in a case of endocervicosis uh, in a young woman. And what you can see are these glands are in the muscularis propria. You can see how this would make a mass-like lesion. But note there's just no stromal reaction to these glands. The glands are just sitting in the muscularis propria and totally benign cytologically. Um, now, when you see endocervicosis, you can see also sometimes coexisting with endometriosis, or you can also see coinciding with endosalpingosis. Here we see some tubular type differentiation. Uh, also, uh, as with all types of malarianosis, involvement of the fat outside the bladder doesn't mean malignant because uh, malarianosis, all forms of it can involve uh, outside the bladder as well as in the bladder. So let's contrast with infiltrating adenocarcinoma of the bladder. So again, many of you have not necessarily seen a lot of examples of adenocarcinoma of the bladder, primary adenocarcinomas, but you've all seen colon cancers, esophageal adenocarcinomas, stomach adenocarcinomas, and basically colon bladder adenocarcinomas look identical. So now you know what you know, bladder adenocarcinomas look like. Some of them are mucinous, but in contrast to the mucinous uh, extravasation, for example, that we saw with intestinal metaplasia, when you see a mucinous adenocarcinoma of the bladder, somewhere lining that mucin, you will find a typical or malignant epithelium uh, lining the, those mucinous lakes, whereas with intestinal metaplasia, it's always acellular mucin. Also, you often get a stromal reaction with these cytologically atypical glands, you know, as you see here. And some of these are just frankly looking like colon cancer or just overtly malignant, intestinal type. And then we get also in the bladder signet ring cell adenocarcinoma, both with sometimes uh, without extracellular mucin or in this case both uh, with extracellular mucin. Now, the only time, so I basically just told you that any time you have an adenocarcinoma in the bladder, uh, it's overtly malignant, and that's how you can tell it versus endocervicosis versus intestinal metaplasia. There's only one situation, there's actually two, there's only two situations that I've ever seen relatively bland adenocarcinomas invading the bladder. They're not primary adenocarcinomas of the bladder. Primary adenocarcinomas of the bladder always have overt cytologic atypia. The two scenarios that I've seen bl relatively, they still have some malignant features, but relatively bland adenocarcinomas invading the bladder is pe metastatic pancreas cancer to the bladder and metastatic endocervical adenocarcinoma involved in the bladder. And both of those tumors can be sometimes very bland cytologically. So this was a case, as a ureter on the bottom. This was a case of a pancreas cancer metastatic to the tissue surrounding the ureter. And it looks very bland cytologically, but you know, pancreas cancer you know, can be very bland. Uh, this is uh, immunohistochemistry for DPC4, which is a marker that's deleted in about 50% of uh, pancreatic cancers. This is another case of pancreatic cancer metastatic to the bladder, but you can see the difference of this versus, for example, endocervicosis. And the difference is there's a stromal reaction to these glands. So when you have a metastasis to the bladder from another organ, it's going to elicit a fibroinflammatory stromal reaction. 
whereas endocervicosis is, again, those glands are just going to be sitting there without any kind of a stromal reaction. There's minimal atypia, but you know, pancreas cancer just often doesn't have a lot of atypia. Now, another type of adenocarcinoma that occurs in the bladder, and I'll show one of them in the slide seminar as well, is clear cell adenocarcinoma. So clear cell adenocarcinoma uh, is tubular, tubulopapillary solid uh, with clear cytoplasm, but not always. Sometimes you can have more eosinophilic cytoplasm like you see here. Sometimes actually dense pink cytoplasm, so the name is somewhat of a mis misnomer. <laughs> Uh, the problem is most clear cell adenocarcinomas are overtly malignant, uh, but there are some clear cell adenocarcinomas that can resemble nephrogenic adenoma. We did a study on these a while ago because, they, to me, they were difficult cases and they represent a pitfall. But the key thing in terms of the differential of nephrogenic adenoma versus clear cell adenocarcinoma is that in nephrogenic adenoma, as I'll show you, the nuclei are vesicular, cleared out, not hyperchromatic. Clear cell adenocarcinoma, the nuclei are hyperchromatic. So here we see these tubules, but these are hyperchromatic nuclei. So this cannot be nephrogenic adenoma. Another case of clear cell adenocarcinoma mimicking nephrogenic adenoma. Again, very dark nuclei, uh, inconsistent with nephrogenic adenoma. Clear cell adenocarcinoma with tubules mimicking nephrogenic adenoma. In addition to the hyperchromatic nuclei, we see a mitotic figure. And nephrogenic adenoma is one of the rare conditions that you virtually never see a mitotic figure. So if you see a mitotic figure in something you think is nephrogenic adenoma, 99% chance you're wrong, and it's probably malignant. I've seen two mitotic figures out of in two cases of hundreds and hundreds of nephrogenic adenomas. So it happens, but exceedingly uncommon. Another case of clear cell adenocarcinoma mimicking nephrogenic adenoma, it's the, the hyperchromatic nuclei that tells you that it's not nephrogenic adenoma. And one of the patterns that we'll see in nephrogenic adenoma is papillary. Um, and so this is a papillary pattern of clear cell adenocarcinoma mimicking nephrogenic adenoma with, again, those hyperchromatic nuclei distinguishing it from nephrogenic adenoma. So let's look at nephrogenic adenoma. So nephrogenic adenoma has multiple different histologies. So first thing, when you think of the term nephrogenic adenoma, the term nephrogenic means kind of coming from the kidney. So a long time ago, whenever this, uh, whoever came up with that term, it was before molecular biology was around. And the reason why they came up with this term nephrogenic adenoma is because some of the patterns in nephrogenic adenoma look like distal collecting tubules. So it was based on morphology. We actually now know, based on a molecular study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, that nephrogenic adenomas actually represent transplanted cells that are shed from the kidney. We all shed renal epithelial tubular cells. Some of those tubular cells, when they go into the bladder in an area that's been injured, where there's a prior instrumentation or a stone, a little erosion, those cells from the kidney get implanted in the bladder and develop into a nephrogenic adenoma. So actually, the term nephrogenic adenoma is 100% correct uh, in terms of its histogenesis. These are renal tubular cells, and that's why they're Pax8 positive, napsin positive. So this is one pattern of nephrogenic adenoma, tubular. Another pattern of nephrogenic adenoma I call the vascular-like pattern. It's basically a tubular pattern, but the tubules become very flattened uh, in terms of the epithelium so that they can closely resemble a vascular space. They closely resemble endothelium. But note here with the nephrogenic adenoma, these nuclei are not hyperchromatic. They're very vesicular, delicate chromatin, nice little small nucleoli, not the dark nuclei that I was talking about with a clear cell adenocarcinoma. Here's another example of a very prominent vascular-like pattern in nephrogenic adenoma with these big, thin, dilated spaces. In most nephrogenic adenomas, you don't see cytologic atypia. The one pattern that you will see cytologic atypia in a nephrogenic adenoma is within the vascular-like structures. You will get hobnail cells that will have some degenerative atypia uh, with these cells poking into these spaces that resemble kind of reactive endothelium. But if you were to stain these, for example, with a keratin, 
these vascular-like channels, you would see that these are not vessels, but in fact, these are tubular structures. As I mentioned, another pattern of nephrogenic adenoma is papillary. Um, and another pattern that we'll also talk about is the, thyroid, the tubules with thyroidization. So if you think of kidney, think of end-stage kidney disease. What we have is thyroidization of the kidney with these tubules filled with colloid. So it makes sense that in a nephrogenic adenoma, which is coming from the kidney, that one of the patterns would, all, again, have this thyroidization. When you look at the papillary structures of a nephrogenic adenoma, uh, very bland, not hyperchromatic nuclei, nice cuboidal lining. Here, another example striking of this thyroidization that looks just like, uh, you know, looks like thyroid tissue. Probably the most confusing pattern of nephrogenic adenoma, and the one that I've seen uh, misdiagnoses, is what I call the signet ring cell-like pattern. So what you have in this pattern are very small tubules. So you can see, for example, this has three nuclei, this has two nuclei. These are tubules. Um, but occasionally, because they're such small tubules, they can be cut and show only a single nucleus closely resembling a signet ring cell. And if you actually do mucic carmine or any other mucin stain, these will be positive. So again, even further resembling a true uh, signet ring cell. Now, one of the clues that this is nephrogenic adenoma, a very helpful clue, is that at least some of the glands, not all of them, but at least some of the glands of nephrogenic adenoma will have this hyaline rim of collagen around some of the glands. Again, not every gland, but almost every case within a, a case of nephrogenic adenoma, if you look for them, some of the glands will have this glassy hyaline membrane. You don't see that in clear cell adenocarcinoma, uh, sometimes in the prostatic urethra, there's a differential of prostate cancer versus nephrogenic adenoma. Finding this glassy membrane also helps you because prostate cancer never has that glassy membrane as well. Here's another nice example showing that hyaline thickened basement membrane uh, collagen around some of the glands. But you could see, for example, in the prostatic urethra on a TUR, this could closely resemble prostate cancer. Um, because of these prominent nucleoli and tubules if you don't think of nephrogenic adenoma. If you think of it, doing a Pax-8 is definitive. Prostate cancers are never Pax-8 positive. Nephrogenic adenoma should be NKX negative. Just like intestinal metaplasia, just like endocervicosis, nephrogenic adenoma can involve the muscarius propria. So just as I mentioned in the outset of this lecture, Glandular mimickers can involve the muscarius propria. It doesn't mean it's malignant. Here we see a case, a nice example of a nephrogenic adenoma, a very papillary nephrogenic adenoma. Here's the muscarius propria, big, thick muscle bundles. You can see very deep down in the muscarius propria, uh, we have nephrogenic adenoma. Rarely, and we reported a small series, you can even see nephrogenic adenoma in the soft tissue outside of the kidney. Uh, and when, in those situations, it's patients who've had um, nephrostomy tubes or some type of instrumentation. And basically, it, the renal tubular cells are pulled out into the soft tissue, and you get nephrogenic adenoma growing out into the fat around the kidney. Here at Higher Power, showing these bland nephrogenic adenoma within muscarius propria. So, typically, in a case of nephrogenic adenoma, and nephrogenic adenoma is often multifocal, but in, you will see multiple patterns. So of all the different patterns I've shown you, there's often multiple. So for example, let's say you had this case, and you were struggling in this area, saying, is this a signet ring cell cancer? You know, I'm concerned about this area. But then you see some thyroid-like tubules. You see the vascular-like tubules. Uh, you see some others that are just more like collecting duct-type tubules. And you basically clued in seeing these other types of patterns of nephrogenic adenoma that then can reassure you that the whole lesion is nephrogenic adenoma. Nephrogenic adenoma always occurs within an inflammatory background. In the prostatic urethra versus prostate cancer, that can be helpful because as I talked about yesterday, prostate cancer, you don't see typically admixed inflammation. There's a unusual variant of nephrogenic adenoma that we were the first to describe, uh, and we've now had a more recent larger paper on it called fibromyxoid variant of nephrogenic adenoma, where the, you see nephrogenic adenoma within this hyaline matrix, this kind of bluish collagen. 
initially when you first look at it, you can't recognize there's a nephrogenic adenoma there. You're not sure what to call it. But if you look, there's these little slit-like spaces. And if you do, for example, a keratin, it'll highlight that you have these little compressed tubules within this fibre that are the, the lesion uh, of the fibromyxoid nephrogenic adenoma. Also, these will be PAX8 positive. So to summarize distinctions or differences between nephrogenic adenoma versus clear cell adenocarcinoma, nephrogenic adenomas are usually small, but they can be large. Clear cell adenocarcinomas are always large. So where that's helpful is on a small biopsy. So one of the problems, at least in the United States, there's two types of situations that we get bladder biopsies. One is from a hospital, and we get a big TUR specimen. The other is actually more common, is that we get bladder biopsies from outpatient centers, from doctors' offices. And in that setting, we get very small specimens, like one millimeter, two millimeter biopsies, because the clinicians are afraid that they don't want the patient to have bleeding. So it's not uncommon to get a tiny specimen, and you might be struggling, is this clear cell adenocarcinoma or nephrogenic adenoma on this small specimen? Even on a TUR, you know, you might struggle. What you can ask or, or look at this cystoscopy is how big was this lesion? If it's a three millimeter lesion, four millimeter lesion, it's not clear cell adenocarcinoma. They should be centimeters. If, on the other hand, it's a bigger lesion, even four or five centimeters, that doesn't help you because sometimes nephrogenic adenomas can be big. So only when it's small, that's helpful because that pretty much rules out clear cell adenocarcinoma. As I mentioned, nephrogenic adenomas are often multifocal versus unifocal for clear cell adenocarcinomas. Um, Clear cell adenocarcinomas are 90% occur in women, but you know, we reported a series in men, so 10% uh, of clear cell adenocarcinomas occur in men. So it's not that helpful of a, of, of a differentiating feature. Uh, nephrogenic adenomas typically have prior instrumentation or some injury, whereas you don't get that with clear cell adenocarcinoma. And then microscopically, Things that you should not see in nephrogenic adenoma, or if you see them, they typically should be focal and make you think at least, could it be something else? So typically in nephrogenic adenoma, you do not see solid areas. It's tubular, just like I showed you, tubular papillary, vascular-like, but not solid. I have seen solid areas in nephrogenic adenoma. They're usually very small areas in it, so it can occur. But in those cases, you just want to make sure it's a classic nephrogenic adenoma. Uh, similarly, you shouldn't see clear cells in a nephrogenic adenoma. Again, rarely I have seen them, so it's not like 100%, but in general, they should make you be careful of making the diagnosis. As I mentioned, mitotic figures, exceedingly rare in nephrogenic adenoma, should make you question the diagnosis. Both are PAX8 positive, so that doesn't help you. What does help is potentially KI67. That's the only immunostain that can help in differentiating nephrogenic <coughs> adenoma versus clear cell adenocarcinoma. And it makes sense uh, that a KI-67 would be helpful because uh, just like I mentioned, mitotic figures are so rare in nephrogenic adenoma, more common in clear cell adenocarcinoma. KI-67 is going to parallel mitotic activity. So here we see a KI-67 in a clear cell adenocarcinoma that mimicked a nephrogenic adenoma. So even in these cases that are kind of lower grade looking clear cell adenocarcinomas, you can see this, you know, 20% positive KI-67. In a clear cell adenocarcinoma with solid sheets that's overtly malignant, you're going to see 50%, 70% KI-67. But this is KI-67 in a nephrogenic adenoma. A lot of these cells that you're seeing are positive are, are not even epithelial cells. Some of these are just lymphocytes. But if you actually look at the epithelium, you know, that's not even epithelium, there's maybe one cell there. Uh, it's ex extremely rare positive cells in KI-67 in a nephrogenic adenoma. So that's a helpful adjunct test to, to do when you're struggling. So now let me switch to mimickers of urethelial cancer. So the first topic uh, that I'll cover is polypoid cystitis, a very common mimicker of, of, of bladder cancer, and I routinely will see cases where it's been misdiagnosed or pathologists are struggling. We wrote a paper on cases where uh, pathologists had misdiagnosed polypoid cystitis as cancer uh, to show the pitfalls. So polypoid cystitis is a reaction to injury. So 
Typically in the literature, they talk about indwelling catheters, but basically you can imagine anything that injures or insults the bladder can result in polypoid cystitis. So a colovescal or a, any kind of a, a, a GI fistula to the bladder, obviously that's an irritant to the, to the bladder. Even a pelvic abscess uh, around the bladder can cause polypoid cystitis. Long-standing urinary obstruction in men can cause polypoid cystitis. Calculi, adjacent to calculi, can cause polypoid cystitis. One of the things that's important, and we found this in our study, is that urologists are often better than the pathologists in recognizing that it's inflammatory. And the reason is, the urologist is looking at, the, in a sense, the gross specimen. They're seeing the entire bladder. So they may see, and a classic description is, they, they'll describe there's this little frond-like structure right next to a fistula opening. Or there's this little polypoid area right next to a calculus. Um, and they'll describe it as looking inflammatory. Or they'll say the whole bladder looks red and inflamed and inflammatory, and there was a polypoid lesion that I biopsied. The pathologist is just looking at a tiny specimen that, out of context of the whole bladder, may mimic uh, papillary cancer. So one thing I always stress, and one thing that I do, if I'm not sure if something is polypoid cystitis or a papillary urethelial neoplasm, is I will contact the urologist or get this cystoscopy report and see what, what, what it looked like. Now, there's a spectrum histologically to polypoid cystitis from those that are extremely dilated, full of edema, which we call bullous cystitis, to polypoid cystitis. And papillary cystitis is when the edema goes away and it becomes more fibrous. Now, when I write up a pathology report, I don't use the terms bullous and papillary. I call it all polypoid cystitis, just kind of different stages of polypoid cystitis, but I think those terms are still helpful to think of it, to recognize how polypoid cystitis can evolve from being very edematous to being fibrotic. So how does polypoid cystitis mimic urethelial cancer? One can have isolated papillary fronds that can closely mimic a tumor. We tend to think of branching fronds as neoplastic and simple fronds as being polypoid cystitis, but occasionally you get branching papillae in a polypoid cystitis. Similarly, in polypoid cystitis, we tend to think of it as a broad-based st uh, structure, but occasionally you can have thinned uh, base in a polypoid cystitis as well. Thickened urethelium, many pathologists associate that with a neoplasm, but polypoid cystitis can have thick or thin urethelium. Reactive urethelial changes that we talked about before uh, can be present in polypoid cystitis. And as I mentioned before, it's, polypoid cystitis is a reaction to injury, so it's not surprising that we may see a lot of mitotic figures. And then when polypoid cystitis kind of dies down, the edema goes away, it becomes more fibrotic, uh, it's harder to recognize that it's, uh, that it's polypoid cystitis because that classic edematous look is missing. So this is uh, you know, what might be termed bullous cystitis, big dilated edematous polypoid structures, and no one's confusing this with a papillary urethelial tumor. It has a broad base. All that white space is basically edema fluid and a sprinkling of inflammatory cells. Again, diagnostically not a problem. Here's another case, diagnostically not a problem. Broad based. This one is starting to branch a little bit, but still full of edema, that pink fluid, broad based, uh, inflammatory cells. Again, again not going to be misdiagnosed as cancer. This is a case of a ureter. So everything I'm talking about in the bladder, in both lectures, uh, this lecture and the prior one, can occur anywhere in the urethelial tract. I'm just talking about it in the bladder because that's where we see most commonly because we have more urethelium. But basically, you can have polypoid pilitis in the renal pelvis, polypoid ureteritis in the ureter, polypoid, obviously, cystitis, polypoid urethritis. So the same applies. This was actually a section from the ureter where there was a fistula from the colon going into the ureter causing polypoid ureter ureteritis. But it's the same process, uh, broad-based, simple folds going up and down. All these dot, little dots are inflammatory cells. So typical polypoid ureteritis. This was a case that was misdiagnosed as papillary urethelial cancer which was polypoid cystitis. And in every case that was misdiagnosed as a, a urethelial neoplasm, there were all these arrows and dots pointing to the one or two fronds that out of context look like a papillary tumor. 
So in this case, for example, this particular structure and this structure is what the outside pathologist had interpreted as a papillary neoplasm. And it's not, you know, it's not uh, unreasonable if you just looked at those two fronds that that couldn't, it may be a papillary tumor. But what the key thing with bladder that I stress is that before, when you get a bladder biopsy, and I tell this to my fellows all the time, you basically just kind of stop. Stop at low power. Don't go zooming in on looking at various things. Stop, just get a low power impression. Does this look neoplastic or does it look inflammatory? Because if you don't do that, and then you start zipping down, going down to a papillary frond, finding mitotic figures, finding some reactive changes on one or two fronds, you will go down the wrong path to calling it a neoplasm. So here, if we look at the entire lesion, what we can notice is that some of these areas, even though these two maybe look, could be confused with the neoplasm, these look more inflammatory. Simple folds going up and down, all this white space is edema, full of inflammation. Uh, you don't see that in a papillary tumor. Uh, anywhere in a papillary tumor. Here, a little higher power. Uh, you know, there's some reactive changes, but uh, this is edematous uh, with lymphocytes in here. That's not a, pac a picture of a, of, a, of, of a papillary urethelial neoplasm. Here's the frond out of context that was misinterpreted as a papillary tumor. And the problem is, even if, let's say, you said, let's say I, you call this a papilloma uh, or a pun lump, you could say, well, that's not the worst thing. I, I didn't call it cancer. But if you call something a papilloma or a pun lump, you're subjecting that patient to lifelong cystoscopies, um, which if you call it polypoid cystitis, you know, that's it. Nothing more needs to be done. This is another case that was misdiagnosed as cancer. And uh, it's, you could see it's like the one or two fronds here that were the ones that were misdiagnosed. And these are the ones that had little arrows pointing to it. But if you look at the overall lesion, this is an inflammatory lesion. Big, simple fold, full of edema, going up and down, full of inflammation. All this dense blue is inflammation here. Uh, some of these are branching. So again, polypoid cystitis can branch. But the overall impression is inflammatory. Um, Sometimes you can get a little reactive inflammation, but this is all dense inflammation, nothing that you would ever see in a papillary urethelial neoplasm. Here's another case of polypoid cystitis, which looks very inflamed, very edematous, simple folds going up and down. But if you look the higher power on this case, and this is why the pathologist was worried, that there are numerous mitotic figures, tons of mitotic figures. But this is an inflammatory condition. The nuclei are vesicular, central nucleoli, a lo lot of polys in here. Don't worry about the mitotic figures. Something, again, my fellows, and I think often trainees, they equate mitotic figures with malignancy. All mitotic figures mean is the tumor, is the, not tumor, the, the cells are proliferating. Could be due to a tumor, but it could be due just as a regenerative reactive process. So first you have to know what the entity is before you start attributing any significance to the mitotic figures. But this is purely a reactive process, and so the mitotic figures are totally consistent with that. Now, as I mentioned, when polypoid cystitis kind of dies down and the inflammation goes away uh, and all that injured tissue starts to heal, it often develops fibrosis. And those, I think, are particularly more difficult to diagnose and recognize as polypoid cystitis because they lack that nice, big, edematous fronds that we, that we associate with, with that, that entity. But the difference is, and I'll show you an example just to, to contrast what uh, normal papillary fronds look like, again, in a tumor. But the difference is this stalk is very pink. And it's pink, not very delicate, loose collagen, but this is dense pink because that's dense fibrosis. Dense pink is not what you see in the stalk of a papillary urethelial tumor. Also, in a papillary urethelial tumor, you don't see sprinkling of lymphocytes. So the combination of this dense pink plus lymphocytes tells you that this is fibrosis, and hence it's a burnt out old polypoid cystitis. But it can look, and this was misdiagnosed, again, as a papillary tumor. You can understand it because it you know, lacks the classic features of polypoid cystitis. Uh, it has some branching to it. You know, the urethelium, some areas can be thickened. Uh, but this dense fibrosis tells you it's an inflammatory lesion. 
Here's another example of uh, older, later stage polypoid cystitis. And this was the area where all the dots were pointing to that was called the papillary tumor. But if we step back and look at the entire lesion, we see these broad-based simple folds. Now these broad-based folds are not full of, uh, they're not white, they're not full of edema like the polypoid cystitis I showed you earlier. They're pink. And they're pink because, again, this is a end-stage polypoid cystitis where that edema has now been replaced by fibrosis. Here is showing you this dense fibrous tissue. That's not what you would ever see in a papillary tumor. But here is the little papillary structures that were misdiagnosed as a papillary neoplasm. But even here, this dense fibrous tissue with a sprinkling of lymphocytes and plasma cells is not what you see in a papillary front. Just to contrast, this is another example of a papilloma, benign urethral papilloma. And look at what's in the stock of a benign urethral papilloma. Very delicate collagen, maybe, maybe a couple lymphs, but very delicate, not that dense fibrous tissue that I just showed you in an end-stage polypoid cystitis, or what some people call papillary cystitis. So I showed you a case yesterday in the slide seminar of pseudocarcinomatous urethelial hyperplasia. Let me go over that entity a little bit more. I think it's a challenging entity. Uh, it's an entity that many pathologists are not uh, intimately familiar with. Um, and this was an entity that was reported relatively a you know, long time ago in 2000 by Robin Young up at Mass General. They described four cases. Um, we subsequently did a larger series, uh, several large series that I'll talk about. But the etiology of pseudocarcinomatous urethelial hyperplasia is it's a reaction to ischemia. But the ischemia basically is not acute ischemia, it's a late ischemia. So it's ischemia that typically occurs, a long-standing ischemia that's probably the initial insult is often years and years before. It can be a local ischemia to the bladder, such as radiation, or it can be long systemic ischemia if somebody who has systemic ischemic disease. Uh, even long-standing irritation can sometimes cause uh, uh, pseudocarcinomatous urethelial hyperplasia. By far and away, at least in the United States, the most common uh, cause of pseudocarcinomatous urethelial hyperplasia is prior pelvic radi radiation therapy, mostly due to prostate cancer. So the most common scenario is I'll get a case that I think looks like pseudocarcinomatous urethelial hyperplasia, and I'll tell my fellows, can you get some history? And 90% of the time, the history is it's, you know, man, 70-something years old, and they had history five years ago, seven years ago of uh, radiation to the prostate. That's classic. But I'll show you some other causes as well. It can definitely mimic prostate, uh, sorry, mimic urethelial cancer. But by itself, it's not associated with any increased risk of cancer. It's purely a mimicker. So this is the series that I talked about. We did a large series, mostly males, and I think they're mostly males because, as I mentioned, the most common etiology is prior radiation for prostate cancer. Similarly, the age is mostly in their 60s, again, for prostate cancer. But you can see it can, it can occur in younger individuals as well. Uh, two th uh, three quarters have prior pelvic radiation therapy. But the, the problem is, and why pathologists have trouble recognizing this entity, is it often develops many, several years after whatever the insult is. So you, the key thing is you will not get any history when you get these specimens, never. Um, basically, you're just gonna get a bladder biopsy, maybe hematuria, and then you have to recognize morphologically that this could be pseudocarcinoma serotonin hyperplasia and try to then go back and elicit this prior history. Now, in addition to radiation therapy, other etiologies that you can imagine could result in ischemia to the bladder, systemic chemotherapy, you know, could be one uh, that we've seen. Indwelling catheters was another scenario that we saw, pseudocarcinomatous urethelial hyperplasia. Uh, intravesical chemotherapy, again, a localized ischemic reaction. Surgery to the pelvis can cause ischemia prior to surgery. Uh, and then there are some patients who have just horrible peripheral vascular disease. But these are not patients who have you know, minor 
angina. These are patients who've had multiple strokes, patients who've had amputations, really severe, severe atherosclerosis. And to the point that they have such severe atherosclerosis around their pelvic vessels that lead to this uh, reactive process. Um, and then some miscellaneous uh, lesions. Um, and in a few places, patients, we couldn't really find a good uh, uh, etiology for this, but it's uncommon. So the key thing, just like I stressed with polypoid cystitis, you want to step back and look at the whole lesion before you go zooming in on something. Same thing with pseudocarcinomatous urethelial hyperplasia. You want to stop, look at overall the lesion, and it's the overall lesion that will give you the diagnosis and prevent you from focusing in on an area that otherwise might look like invasive cancer. So the first thing you see with uh, pseudocarcinomatous urethelial hyperplasia is going to be hemorrhage and fibrin, and maybe hemosiderin as a long-standing sequela of the hemorrhage. Hemosiderin, hemorrhage, and fibrin is not a reactive process that you see with invasive urethelial cancer. Just you don't see that. I showed you before in the slide in the lecture before this invasive urethelial cancer. Most of those didn't have any reaction at all, but none of them had hemorrhage, fibrin, and, and hemosiderin. So you look at this and you look at low power and say, okay, this doesn't look like cancer. The problem is when you look at the epithelium associated with that hemorrhage and fibrin, you will see irregular nests of cells, uh, sometimes with some atypia. Um, and out of context, we talked about invasive urethral cancer. Some of the features of invasive urethral cancer are small irregular nests, sometimes with retraction artifact. So if you just looked at the urethelium, you would call this cancer. Because it, that's, it's not normal to have urethelium, this irregular nest down in the lamina propria. But in the context of the entire case, that is what pseudocarcinomatous urethelial hyperplasia looks like. Here's another example, low power. You see fibrin, you see hemorrhage. You see a lot of little nests down in the lamina propria. Uh, these nests can have some atypia, some prominent nucleoli, um, but that's totally consistent with the diagnosis. Another example, and you'll see they all look fairly similar. So once you've seen these images in this lecture, if a case comes across your desk, it is something that you know, you'll be able to recognize. Uh, with these irregular nests that, again, out of context look like cancer, but in the context of the entire lesion are totally benign. Sometimes these uh, nests will encircle the fibrin. That's a characteristic pattern where they kind of go around the fibrin. So the reason why these look like cancer Sometimes these can be extensive, so all those little nests in the lamina propria, sometimes it can involve over half the lamina propria. So it's not always a you know, very focal finding. Um, they can have prominent nuclei, like I showed you. They can have uh, some moderate pleomorphism. And just like we talked about with polypoid cystitis, these are proliferative. So not surprisingly, you can have mitotic figures in these lesions. The key things to, to recognize in their benign, sometimes you'll see, again, hemosiderin, vascular congestion, edema. Um, remember, mimickers of nephrogenic, oh, sorry, mimickers of urethelial cancer never involve the muscularis propria. So with pseudocarcinomatous urethelial hyperplasia, you'll never see it in the muscularis propria, only in lamina propria. Sometimes you get a clue that there's been radiation with thickened vessels, but the most important thing that I've emphasized is the fibrin, hemorrhage, hemosiderin. So now let's turn to inverted urethelial papilloma, most commonly seen in the trigone, but pretty much anywhere. And again, these can occur in the ureter, the, bl uh, the bladder, prosthetic urethra, um, every site where we have urethelium, usually solitary. A good clinician can sometimes recognize uh, that these are not papillar urethelial uh, neoplasms, but in fact are pap inverted papilloma, because they are actually smooth shaped, whereas a papillar urethelial tumor looks like coral. It looks more like a, uh, like a true papillar lesion. These can be small or big, so size doesn't help you. Um, importantly, these are totally benign. So once they're taken out, these patients do not need follow-up cystoscopy. So you want to make the right diagnosis and save those patients uh, from lifelong uh, cystoscopies. So key thing, low power. Again, don't, don't go to higher power. And whenever you see a lot of inverted growth patterns, you want to look for two things. First, you look at the top of the lesion, the surface of the lesion. 
and say, do I see good exophytic papillary structure? Now here there's one little structure, and based pretty much that was it in the whole case. If you have the entire surface is smooth and kind of without exophytic, you can allow for a few little fronds. That's okay still for inverted papilloma, but you shouldn't see a lot of them. The other thing is you look at the nature of the nest. So in inverted papilloma, the nests are this anastomose in columns, like a jigsaw puzzle or, or canals or a labyrinth, whereas in inverted growth pattern of carcinoma, the nests are rounded. So it's a different silhouette. Here again, we see another case of a benign inverted urethelial papilloma with these anastomose in columns of urethelium and the surface looking totally normal. Some places you can see it connecting to the surface, other areas just underneath it. Another case, surface smooth, and no exophytic fronds. This one has a lot of colloid cysts. That's common in inverted papilloma. Here a little higher power showing the, uh, the colloid cysts. Inverted papilloma also has no cytologic atypia, just very uniform nuclei, often nuclear grooves. Uh, the other feature that you see in inverted papilloma is that the nuclei stream parallel to these, these anastomosin columns, often with a little bit almost peripheral palisading along the edge. No cytologic atypia. Mitotic activity extremely rare, and if you see any mitotic figure, it's going to be at the base uh, at the junction of the stroma and the epithelium. Now, occasionally you can see some papillary structures in an otherwise classic inverted papilloma, but most of the time when you see those papillary structures, the epithelium in those papillary structures still look like that epithelium that I showed you in inverted papilloma, this streaming uh, epithelium, very distinctive, not something you would see in a papillary urethelial uh, carcinoma. In contrast, this is the inverted growth pattern of carcinoma, rounded nests. Um, most cases with inverted growth pattern of cancer will have an exophytic papillary component, but there are rare cases where that exophytic component can be very minimal or even absent. So you have to recognize the difference between inverted papilloma and inverted carcinoma is also based on the nature of these nests, rounded nests versus the anastomosing, and also that these nests have some cytologic atypia. We can see, just like an exophytic papillary urethelial carcinoma component, the inverted component has the same scattered darker nuclei, some scattered mitotic figures. This is a very rare case of an inverted pun lump. So as, as I mentioned, it's rare for a tumor to have a purely inverted growth pattern, a carcinoma or a pun lump. Most of the time there'll be an exophytic papillary component, but it does happen. Uh, but in contrast to inverted papilloma, these are roundedness. And cytologically, it's the same cytology of a pun lump, this uniform cytology uh, without uh, scattered hyperchromatic nuclei. But we don't have that spindling or that, we show, that I showed you, for example, uh, that we see in inverted papilloma. So to kind of summarize versus urethelial cancer, inverted papillomas have no cytologic atypia, Uncommon mitotic activity when present limited to the basal layer. There's no inflammation, no reactive stroma. You never have keratin formation. You might have some squamoid changes, but never keratin. And again, this is a mimicker of urethelial cancer. It can be big, uh, it can involve the lamina propria, but never will go into the muscarius propria. Next topic is, is a challenging one and can be challenging, which is nested variant of urethelial carcinoma. This was described by uh, Bill Murphy, uh, where even in the title, he said it's a neoplasm resembling proliferation of von Bruns nests. And that's your main differential. So I've emphasized how mimickers of urethelial carcinoma do not involve the muscular propria. So if you see urethelial nests in the muscular propria, it must be cancer. There's only three exceptions, and these are not tumors, it's really an normal anatomical variants. So the ureter goes through the muscular propria. So you will see a section of urethelium next in the middle of muscle, which is the ureter going in the muscle. So if they bias to see the intramural portion of the ureter, you may see some totally benign urethelium next to muscle. Doesn't mean it's cancer, it should look just like normal urethelium, and you know, if you're not sure, you can see where the biopsy was taken. Another pitfall, and I've seen this happen, is diverticulum. 
So when you have a diverticulum in the bladder, it's basically the urethelium goes through the, through the wall uh, out into the, the surrounding perivascular soft tissue. So just like an intramural ureter, you're going to have some urethelium going through the, next to the muscularis propria. So if they biopsy the mouth of a diverticulum, you may see benign urethelium next to muscularis propria. So that's, again, it's not really invading the muscularis propria, but it's a pitfall. And the other thing where you actually can see urethelium actually in the muscularis propria is in the urethras. So just keep that in mind. That should always be in the dome. Um, it shouldn't look malignant, but recognize that that's, that is a site where urethelium uh, nests uh, can be within the muscularis propria. So nested cancer, typically older men, um, un very uncommon in women. Clinical presentation, nonspecific. Everything in the bladder is hematuria, so that never helps you. Um, it occurs anywhere in the bladder. It's uncommon in the ureter and renal pelvis, and I probably should change this slide because this was an older, uh, it used to be th that it was extremely rare, but we have seen and we actually have a series of nested cancers in the renal pelvis and ureter that's accepted for publication uh, in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology, um, but it's still rare. So I would stress that before you die, thinking of diagnosing nested cancer in the renal pelvis and ureter, you should be very cautious. I would never do it on a small biopsy. Most of our cases of nested cancer in the renal pelvis and ureter, they presented as big masses and the clinician just took them out. So they didn't even have a biopsy. But I'll tell you why on a biopsy it can be a real problem. So why is nested cancer so difficult to diagnose as malignant? very uniform bland cells, at most some focal moderate atypia, sometimes deeper in the lesion. Um, you may see mitoses, but typically not. Um, you're not going to find vascular invasion. Uh, and the other thing that's very tricky is in many cases of nested cancer, the surface urethelium looks normal. In some cases, you may see non-invasive or a papillary low-grade cancer on the surface. That helps you. But often, it's just totally normal urethelium on the top. So you don't have a precursor to help you. Now, despite nested cancers looking very bland, these are actually aggressive tumors. Stage for stage, the same as high-grade invasive urethral cancer. This was a large series from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, it's cystectomy, 69% were either uh, out of the T3 or T4, almost 20% positive lymph nodes, you know, less than 50% uh, 10-year cancer-specific survival. So this is an example of nested cancer. And you can see the surface is totally normal on the top. You can see these tumors, these nests are down in the muscularis propria. So that we have nests in the muscularis propria. This has to be cancer. So even though these nests are as bland as anything you will ever see in terms of urethelium, no strong reaction, the fact that these are down in the muscle, this has to be cancer. Now, if you've not diagnosed nested cancer before, you will be nervous diagnosing it because it's just so bland. But what you have to, again, tell yourself is nothing with urethelial nests should be down in the, lamin in, in the muscularis propria. Now, often you don't get a stromal reaction. They can just be sitting there. Now, you can also diagnose nested cancer, and it's more difficult if it's in the lamina propria without muscularis propria invasion. And the way you can diagnose it is that the nests are too small, too irregular, and going too deep to be Br von Bruns nests. Here we see at higher power, these small little nests, very bland cytologically, uh, but too small, too crowded. Some of them are fused together. That's not what von Bruns nest looks like. Sometimes you get tubular formation in nested cancer. Uh, sometimes it can be almost all tubular differentiation, but most of the time you will see some solid nests as well. Another case of nested cancer, surface urethelium is normal. These back-to-back -back tubules are small tubules, back-to-back, -back, has to be nested cancer, not von Bruns nest. Higher power, very bland cytologically, but again, back-to-back, -back, small nest. There's also a variant that, we, that I uh, uh, wrote about called the large nested variant of uh, urethelial cancer where instead of the classic small nest, which is what was described by Bill Murphy uh, in many subsequent articles, you can get the same very bland nest, but they're much larger. Uh, now, in this particular example, it's, I think it's easier to recognize as malignant. First of all, it's in the muscularis propria, so we know it has to be malignant. But this one also has a desmoplastic stromal reaction, an inflammatory reaction. 
uh, here you can see, but you can see that these nests are just totally bland. And these cases I struggle with also, um, because I'll see these totally bland nests that are deeper down. Um, when they're in the muscle, again, I feel more comfortable to be able to call it cancer, but sometimes when they're not in the muscle, it becomes even more of a struggle. So to summarize in terms of looking at the von Brun's nest in the bladder, ureter, and nested urethral cancer. Bladder, as I'll show you in subsequent images, tends to have larger, uniform nests. The ureter, the problem is the net, you have von Brun's nests are very small and crowded. As I'll show you, they're linear or lobular. We just talked about nested cancer where you have small, crowded nests. So you can see that there's a lot of overlap between the ureter von Brun's nest and nested cancer. They both have small, crowded nests. The difference is a linear lobular, uh, where these are going to be more infiltrative. But on a biopsy, you can't appreciate that difference. All von Brun's nests have an even base. They don't irregularly go down invading. But on a biopsy, you can't appreciate that. Um, and on a superficial biopsy of nested cancer, it may be difficult to appreciate as well. Von Brun's nests and nested cancers also have cyst formation. In the bladder, you tend to see these larger cysts, which is helpful. In the ureter, you have small cysts. Same thing with nested cancer. So again, overlap between ureter von Brun's nest and nested carcinoma. So let's look at some example of florid proliferation of von Brun's nest. So this is a section from a ureter done for renal cell carcinoma. No urethral cancer anywhere in the specimen. And this is actually quite, quite common to see uh, in a ureter. And what we see is a florid proliferation of von Brun's nest. Uh, and, but what you see in a ureter is that often that florid proliferation of von Brun's nest is circumferential around the ureter. If this were carcinoma, nested cancer, you wouldn't have a circumferential cancer all growing at about the same level around the ureter. The other thing we can see at just scanning magnification is that these have a relatively flat base to it, that they're not irregularly infiltrating down. Here they're very linear, was what I referred to earlier, or lobular. But the problem is, if I got a biopsy, and this I just took a higher power of that at the previous image, if I got this on a biopsy, I can't appreciate that this is linear, lobular, non-infiltrative. Could this be nested cancer? Absolutely. So I cannot tell on a biopsy nested cancer in the renal pelvis or ureter versus von Brun's nest. And so basically never make the diagnosis of nested cancer in the ureter or renal pelvis on a biopsy. I just wouldn't even do it. Uh, you, you might say a typical urethral proliferation, you know, the differential is nested cancer versus florid proliferation of von Brun's nest. Um, and ultimately, you'll have to leave it up to the clinician. If there's a big mass there, they'll take it out. If there's not, maybe they'll get a repeat biopsy. Here again, that linear array, typical of uh, von Brun's nest. This is what florid cystitis cystica and von Brun's nest look like in the bladder. As with all the mimickers I've talked about today, they make a mass-like lesion or can make a mass-like lesion. Uh, they, these are very uniform, rounded, larger than von Brun's ne uh, than nested cancer. They have these larger cyst formations, very bland cytologically with the cyst formation. This, I think, is a nice example of florid proliferation of von Brun's nest because you can appreciate how the base is very flat, non-infiltrative, whereas nested cancer grows down irregularly. This one with nice cyst formation as well. So nested cancer is critical to recognize. It's aggressive despite being bland. Basically, you have to do it on the H&E. Immuno is not helpful. Um, if, you're not sh if you're not sure, uh, ask basically for more tissue. The last entity I'll cover very briefly is a prostatic infarct. And you'll think, why am I covering a prostatic infarct in a mimickers of urethral cancer uh, talk? Um, but I'll explain, and you'll see why it's, uh, shortly. It's associated with either huge BPH or systemic atherosclerosis. You can have spikes in the PSA. Most of the time, it's an incidental finding. If you have a TUR that's a nice, clear uh, cut through the middle of the lesion, it's very organized. You have the infarct in the middle. You have this immature urethral metaplasia that, as I'll show you, can closely mimic cancer uh, next to the infarct. And then as you get away from it, things kind of die down and become more less atypical. So here we see dead tissue infarct here. Here's the interface with the urethelial nest. Things start looking more normal as you go away. 
The problem is if you look at those urethelial nests right at the interface of the infarct and the surrounding tissue, it can look indistinguishable from invasive high-grade urethelial cancer. So just looking at this at high power, you know, I couldn't tell this in cancer. But in the context of the whole lesion, it's an infarct. Same thing, my, we talked about mitotic figures. Doesn't mean it's malignant. These infarct can have uh, mitotic figures. So how do you recognize it's an infarct if it you know, looks like cancer at higher power? Just like we talked about with pseudocarcinoma dysterothelial hyperplasia. Step back and look at the, what this background tissue is. An infarct is going to be just like pseudocarcinoma dysterothelial hyperplasia. You're going to see hemorrhage in the stroma, hemosiderin. Urethelial cancer would never have hemorrhage in hemosiderin. That's a clue that this is, pseudo, is just an infarct with reactive tissue. Low power, all this hemorrhage in the stroma, we know it's, it's an infarct, it's an old infarct, uh, and you can often see necrotic debris in these infarcts as well. So to summarize, I've covered a wide range of benign mimickers of both adenocarcinoma and urethelial cancer. I've stressed how it's important to get the impression of urologists in certain differential diagnoses. In other entities, I've also stressed how it's critical to look at the overall histology rather than focus on isolated features that out of context may be indistinguishable from cancer. Also, any doubt, especially on a small specimen, you know, request more tissue. And uh, this is the differential diagnoses in urological pathology book, uh, which um, I published with George Netto, which basically covers, very similar to my lectures, differential diagnoses in various entities. And with that, I'll end. Thank you so much. Pax8? Yeah, so it's, um, it's GATA positive. Uh, nested uh, typically will be GATA positive. Pax8 typically won't help. <laughs>